stay out of the beds, okay? All right, welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do on Sundays. Uh, last week was a uh, subscriber Sunday. Thank you guys for participating, sending in your photos for that. Uh, I think there was, oh, there was 10 minutes of photos, nine plus minutes of photos, something like that. So uh, there was a lot of participation in that video. I've put up a, by the time you see this, I'm recording this in the middle of the week because I actually have a pretty uh, exciting weekend. Um, by the time you see this, it, this will be over what I'm saying right now, but a lot of um, horticultural, horticulturalist friends are coming from all over the country because there's a symposium in Raleigh uh, this uh, Friday and Saturday. In fact, I'm picking people, you know, picking people up from the airport. and um, So a lot going on um, in, um, I get to hang out with some folks who I don't get to see. Uh, often enough, so I'm excited about that, and so I'm, shoot, I'm shooting. I'm shooting this early. You will have seen a couple of videos this week of uh, guess the plant videos, where I'm just shooting some some plants that I talked about a lot on the channel to see if you guys can uh, ID them. Uh, and anything, honestly, if you review, you know, the way I've gone about learning plants all these, you know, God, a long time, 36, 37 years is you don't really learn them the first time you see them. You have to see them multiple times. And so, um, you know, I'll run into something that I've seen sometime in the past and then I'm more familiar with it going forward after that. So sometimes um, whether you know them or not, um, these videos could potentially be help, helpful to you because then you'll see it again somewhere and you go, oh, you know, I remember it from that. So anyway, that's how, uh, you know, that, that's how we learn is just repeating things, obviously. Uh, what else will you have seen the the tour from this landscape um, this week? It's very dry out here. Uh, we just have not gotten any rain um, of any consistent uh, nature at all. And so this is the first time in two years I've had to do kind of any general watering here. I mean, normally my watering is watering the containers and then maybe there's a shrub that's telling me it's dry uh, here or there. Um, come here. Come here. But for the most part, I haven't had to just put a sprinkler on the entire landscape, and I've had to do that a few times here. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping we can, you know, find some rain pretty soon. And then you will have seen a tour from my buddy Rob's over here, where I just do a stable. I just walked around with a stabilizer and the, cam and the camera, and um, I, I had done a couple other videos talking through the plants at his landscape, but I had never shown it in like peak spring flowering, late spring flowering. So uh, nice place. So. Let's get started on some questions that were asked in the last couple of weeks uh, videos. Um, somebody had a girdled root on a red bud, uh, meaning that it was planted. You know, what happens is, you know, sometimes we don't break the roots up on plants well enough and they keep wrapping around one another. And then later you'll see a root that's just completely wrapped over another root girdling um, one. And uh, somebody had recommended that they cut that one that was wrapping over. And you can definitely do that. And you could do it probably best in the winter time. But it wouldn't surprise me if you lose, I mean, you know, uh, it's possible that you lose some sort of branch on the tree um, up above. Doing it in the winter is the best time to do it. So when it's completely dormant. But you can take a, you can take a saw, you know, and cut that, um, and cut that one uh, root off that's obviously going to cause damage if you don't. So um, you, you, you kind of have, you don't have a lot of choice. Muskogee crepe myrtle is blooming. Uh, they've had it for two years. I guess this was in. I think this was in Savannah, um, and it only get, it only blooms for a few days or, or two, a couple weeks and then stops. And it's done it a couple years. It's in the hell strip, which a lot of the crepe myrtles are in the hell strip. I wonder if it does need some additional water though, as it's leafing out in the spring while it's immature, or if it's getting enough sun. That's another thing too. Savannah is a pretty daggone shady place out on those, even out on the roads. Uh, in parts of it. So if it's getting enough sun, um, I think it may need some additional water. It just may not be able to produce all the energy it needs to leaf out, set flower buds, and hold on to them for any significant uh, length of time if it's getting enough sun. Um, that's the only thing I could, I could come up with. Again, I say this frequently, if that tree is not making you happy in another year or two, you know, out it comes. Um, you know, no reason to think about it for five more years. Um, you know, and they're, they're, you know, that's one thing you can get in a smaller container probably and replace it with a different uh, variety. Holly decided indoors was better on a hot, uh, on a hot day. Uh, let's see, somebody, uh, I had a bunch of flamethrower um, red bud questions uh, based on, I guess, the flamethrower red buds that were in the uh, Subscriber Sunday video. And then Rob has one over here in his uh, landscape. One was, um, 
when to cut lower branches off that are hanging way low. I would do that anytime. You could cut them off right now, it wouldn't matter. Um, another one was similar to my service berry out front. Uh, they have a very skinny trunk, but a lot of tree on the top. That tree is very brittle, and I would probably do some top pruning on it uh, to slow it down a bit. Uh, at a minimum, you'd want to stake it uh, to make sure that uh, it's not going to break apart in any kind of uh, any kind of weather event. So that's one that I would I would actually be concerned about. Um, is a red bud that has a small trunk and a lot of leaves on the top of it. I've got a neighbor with a gold foliage one that his kind of broke apart last year. He's done some pruning on it now and gotten it back in uh, better shape. But uh, again, those trees are racing one another in the, in the nursery uh, and, they're, and they have thin trunks and lots on the top. So I would take some of the weight out of it, you know, um, on some of this new growth. Uh, and then I got another question about red buds. It's a red bud week. Uh, it w I remember being, um, uh, the person asked, uh, what was it? What was it? They, uh, they asked, oh, why all the named, the named cultivars seem to be smaller than the native red buds. Um, I think most of them just kind of grow slower. I mean, if you have purple, if you have a purple foliage red bud, my purple foliage red bud at the old house, my forest pansy red bud got gigantic, but it was definitely much slower growing than regular Circus canadensis. So if it's purple foliage, yellow foliage, variegated foliage, has some sort of special quality to it in any way, shape, or form, it's likely going to grow slower. So that probably is as much as anything you're seeing is the fact that they're growing slower than our, than our natives. And then some of them have obviously been selected for more compact size for you know, ornamental landscape, to be better ornamental landscape plants, to be more compact and that kind of thing. So, but ultimately, all of them are going to get big, except for the weeping one. That one's, you know, that's as tall as that thing's going to get. It's just going to go down to the ground uh, from here. But the uh, upright ones are going to be upright ones, uh, just slower in all likelihood. Um, somebody said, do I clean my nursery containers that I reuse? Typically I'll dry them out, flip them, I'll flip them upside down, let them dry completely out, and then I'll beat them on something a bit to get any of the loose soil out of them. This could be trays for my seedlings or whatever it is, just let them dry out. Bang them on each other a couple times, put them together and reuse them. Unless I pulled something out of that container that was uh, diseased, then I'm not worried about it. Uh, and um, so, yes, I just, re I reuse them, I don't wash them, I get them mostly cleaned out um, just by letting them dry out. Uh, so of course, I, say, I have to say Laura Petalum this week because somebody said their purple daydream, I don't think you can see it, it's right behind me right here. Their purple daydream Laura Petalum is green, it's not purple, it's likely in too much shade. They actually ask in the question, do you think it's in too much shade? Yeah, likely, uh, that's the issue. Sun is coming out on me, it's been cloudy and I came out here to uh, shoot this because of that. I hope that uh, uh, we'll, we'll see how this works out. Um, somebody asked about when to plant a Shoal Creek Vitex in Zone 7B, Oklahoma, um, and wanted to know if they should tuck it up against the house or can that go out in open space. Uh, Vitex is Zone 6 hardy, and so I think you, in Zone 7B in Oklahoma City, which I don't really trust Oklahoma City's Zone 7B. I mean, we had, they, you guys had a zero, below zero night just last year, um, so, you know, um, I think it's more likely seven. I would treat Oklahoma City probably a seven A with that wind component that you have in the winter as well. Um, but you know, if you're worried about something being marginal, you want to plant it as close to spring as you possibly can so it can get established before the winter. But it needs lots of sun. Those vitex, if you put it up too close to the house and it's in the shade, it's going to be thin and not bloom a whole lot. So it needs it needs to go out in open space and be planted in early in, as early in the year as possible. So if you had one right now, I'd put it in the ground. It'll be well established enough in zone seven in Oklahoma City to make it through this first winter. If you got a night coming that was like ridiculous, I mean, it was gonna be, you know, zero, it was gonna be two, it was gonna be three, it was definitely abnormally cold, and you had something like that, um, you might, that's something you might wanna think about throwing a blanket over in its first winter, uh, even without leaves on it, if you knew, you know, you were having some sort of abnormal weather event. So, you know, so keep that in mind. You can plant it in, you know, plant it, and then when it goes into that first winter, know that if it's be well below your normal average temperatures, you can throw a blanket over it for a night or two. Uh, let's see, somebody asked when to prune an umbrella pine. They just have some wild branches down at the bottom of it. Now would be fine anytime. Anytime you got those crazy limbs on things, you can get rid of them. Um, 
uh, general pruning, a lot of times we're going to talk about in the winter, you know, um, or right after something flowers, if it's a flowering thing. But a conifer like this, where you're not thinking about the flowers or whatever, if it's got a crazy limb on it, got a few crazy branches, prune it anytime. Uh, that doesn't really matter all that much. Keep in mind, if you prune something in September, that's how it's going to look the whole winter because it's not going to have time to recover. So that's it's not a bad month necessarily to prune it other than it's gonna be ugly all winter. So the sooner the better so that it has time to come back out and you know look good through this first winter. Um, somebody asked about, have they have creeping Jenny and wanna know if it will outcompete the other things in the bed as it spreads out. And they have some shrubs and things. The shrubs I'm not gonna worry about. I've got sedum growing around a Daphne over here and some other shrubby things. And it, it, shrubs are okay, um, they'll, they'll be fine. And for the most part, the shrubs will shade that space out so it really can't get up under there very well anyway but some of your perennial uh flowering things they mentioned lucanthemum you know i wouldn't let it strangle my lucanthemum from the bottom um uh they tend to not be you know shasta daisies tend not to be the most hardy the hardiest things in the world uh, so uh i probably wouldn't let it get right up through my you know right up through my perennial bed um uh, I, I probably wouldn't let it happen. But around my shrubs, I'm not gonna worry about it. They'll, they'll compete just fine. Um, oh, somebody pointed out the yellow cosmos in the subscriber video from last week. You will have seen my tour video from this week here and I have some uh, light yellow uh, coleus out here on the driveway. I, I actually like yellow coleus a lot. That person's photo had a bright yellow, mine's like a pale yellow, but if you can find the seed for yellow um, cosmos, uh, I do like it a lot. Um, somebody asked when to cut hydrangeas if you don't know what kind you have after it flowers. That's the answer to that. That's the answer to anything. If you don't know what you have, just prune it after it flowers. We've heard Dr. Armitage say that a few times on this channel and it's definitely true. If you don't know the type of hydrangea you have, prune it after it flowers if it needs pruning. Uh, somebody asked about how to keep the mildew down on their zinnias. Really, the best thing to do is start getting zinnias that are mil more mildew resistant because uh, a lot of the upright, taller zinnias, especially here in the southeast, you know, where, where it's just muggy, muggy, muggy. They come up, they look beautiful. Sometime around the 1st of July or so, they start to get that, that you know, they start to get mildew and start to get all kinds of problems. But I use the Bennery Giants and a couple others. You know, you can look this up. You can Google, you know, um, uh, mildew resistant zinnias because a lot of the new hybrids are we're bred. I mean, that's literally if you're if you're if you're breeding zinnias, it has to be at the top of your list. You know, same thing with like roses. Black spot has to be at the top of your list for you know what I mean. The um, if you're breeding big leaf hydrangeas, it has to be you know leaf spot um, issues have to be at the top of your list for breeding. You have to you're, you're selecting for those issues. And in, trust me, in zinnias, it's definitely so. Late, the newest varieties are going to be the most resistant uh, to mildew. My perfusion zinnias, my little annual. Uh, zinnias, um, uh, well, they're all annuals, but my, my little more compact ones that are in the big annual bed in the front out there, I've got, never have mildew on those at all. So, but those are lower growing. They're not the giant zinnias, but the Benry giants um, are usually a good choice. Um, but regardless, by August, you know, something's, something's wrong with them. And I underplant mine with a uh, uh, lantana. And so that when the zinnias come out, the lantanas uh, looking fantastic. The sun is getting brighter. Still seems to be, still seems to be doing fine. Somebody asked me if I have a hardy hibiscus and if I was planning on getting any hardy hibiscus. I do have a hardy hibiscus. I'll show it in next week's uh, tour video. It hasn't started blooming yet. I've been trying to, on these weekly tour videos, just show things that I haven't shown very much. I know I get probably do get repetitive on a couple things because a couple things just get, are exciting. You know, the dahlias and things like that to me, um, which are dahlias in the frame behind me blooming right now. Um, but I do have a hardy hibiscus in the front garden. I can't have seven of them of anything here, really, because there's, you know, there's limited space. But uh, definitely amongst my favorites. Somebody has uh, iron deficiency on a hydrangea. Don't know what kind of hydrangea. Probably doesn't matter. In Las Vegas, wanted to know if they can use, you know, iron or chelated iron. I will say that we're always recommended to put down iron if we see iron deficiencies, and where iron deficiencies uh, show up is. Um, chlorosis in the leaf where you'll see the veins of the leaf will still be dark green but the the, the parts in between the veins will be a lighter um, uh, yellow color and that's chlorosis 
and we're always recommended put down iron, put down chelated iron, whatever it is, but most soils have plenty of iron. Iron is a readily available, you know, um, nutrient. So, I mean, rare, a metal, it's, 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 not, it's not rare. So typically you don't need iron. You know, if any, anybody that recommends, again, I can't say this enough, anybody that recommends something to you that's not based on a soil test does not belong recommending things to people. You need to get a soil test done and find out if you actually have low iron. My guess is almost certainly you don't. What you're gonna find out is your pH is very high. And if your pH is very high, iron is not readily available, okay? There's a couple ways that you can end up with iron deficiencies. Well, several ways. One is you don't have enough iron in the soil. Usually unlikely. Number two, most likely, the pH is very high. So your pH is 7.2, 7.5, 8, 8.5, something like that. And iron is most available when the soil pH is between like four and six and a half, something like that. So, or, you know, three and six and a half. Um, and so heavy iron feeding plants would prefer pHs uh, that are lower. Iron won't fix your pH. It will just, it will just still be in the soil, still not be able to be taken up. So that's, that's two things, right? Um, it's, it's not there or it's there and your pH is too low. Or thirdly, your phosphorus can be very high and phosphorus can actually lock up um, iron. Meaning that you'd have iron, your pH was right, but the phosphorus can lock it up. So you have to get, you need to get a soil test done. I have a feeling your soil test is gonna come back and tell you your pH is very high. If it is, you can use sulfur. If you have iron there, you can try to lower your pH using sulfur or something like that. It's not a very, it's not a long-term approach. You should really, if you have alkaline soils like that, um, especially in a place like Las Vegas, um, where you're drought stricken, you probably should be thinking about uh, using plants that are more, um, that like to be where they, <laughs> that wouldn't mind being in Vegas. Uh, you know, hydrangea is probably not, probably not a great example of that. So uh, just keep, to keep those things in mind. Again, I picked that question because I just want to repeat. Anyone who tells you to change, you know, put, put, a, put something other than a basic fertilizer. I mean, we're not talking about basic, just general fertilizers here. We're talking about one specific thing, like put down phosphorus, put down potassium, put down more nitrogen, put down, and they're not telling you to get a soil test. They're not, you know, um, they shouldn't be qualified. Um, get a soil test done. If you have issues, not everybody needs a soil test, but if you're having some sort of obvious nutrient deficiency issue, get a soil test done. I think you'll find your pH is out of whack more often than you have a nutrient deficiency in the soil. Okay, uh, somebody asked about how deep a root barrier would have to be for Bermuda grass, meaning they want to put some sort of plastic or metal or concrete border, whatever it is, between their turf and their beds, and they don't want that Bermuda to cross over it. I think Bermuda can root down about six feet uh, I, I read one day um, that, that you know, a lot of those turf grasses can root down very, very deep. You don't have to go six feet down, obviously. Um, it's not, it's not going to move through the soil that way and come up, but I think you'd need it something at least six inches deep. Most of the roots are going to be that top six inches. Probably to be safe, you'd probably want to go, you know, 10 inches deep with something. Um, and it's still, gosh, that stuff is amazing. It can go under, I've seen it go under sidewalks. And so, you know, how thick is a sidewalk pour? You know, four inches for sure. Um, hopefully four inches, <laughs> you never know with, the, with the home building. Uh, but you know, hopefully it's, you know, but I've seen it go under the sidewalks. And so, um, you know, I would, I would think to be safe, something a little more than six inches is probably uh, preferable for that. Let's see. Somebody said their petals on their cone flowers are getting eaten before they fully open up. That could be Japanese beetles. Uh, I doubt it's rabbits. Rabbits will eat cone flowers like crazy. They love cone flowers, but they typically eat the whole plant. Uh, I don't think they would just concentrate, come over and concentrate on the petals. They'll eat your cone flowers right down to the ground, and you'll have cone flowers blooming about six inches tall if you have rabbit problems. Uh, so it's like the Japanese beetles. It could potentially be deer, but deer probably would pop the whole top off. Cone flowers are considered deer resistant. Flower buds. They don't care. They don't read the deer resistant list and they'll come pop the flower buds off of them. Uh, groundhogs, uh, probably several different uh, things like that that would, that, would, that would eat them. But Japanese beetles are pretty, pretty tough on just the, um, e e eating the petals themselves. Okay, uh, let's see. Somebody asked if they could keep a Roman candle protocarpus, which was also in this week's tour video here, about four feet tall permanently in Houston. Um, yes. 
This sun is now, I'm just in the absolute full sun. Uh, let's see. Okay. This could be a weird, um, a weird shadowy video. Um, yeah, I think you could keep Roman candles, gr Roman candle grows super slow. So I think you can keep it four feet without any problem. And you can shear the sides on it if you want a flat side. Somebody asked when to prune a Jane Magnolia. They want to open up the middle a bit, see the stems now. Now's the time to do it. They ask if you needed to be in the dead of winter, and it could be. I mean, just doesn't matter. I would get out there and do it sooner the better. Um, you know, if anything, it will reduce stress uh, for the summer. It'll be less less it has to maintain. So I, I'd go ahead and open it up right now. Uh, somebody asked if I do videos on seed collecting. Yes, I want to do. I've you know I do a lot of seed collecting out here. I did last year, and I didn't show very much of it. And I will uh, do more of that this year. Somebody asked about transplanting peonies. There's actually a video on the channel for transplanting peonies. You can go and take a look at that video. Um, uh, just search it. Um, search transplanting peonies and Jim Putnam or something like that. Uh, and uh, you'll find that one pretty quickly. All the peonies that are back here behind me, back here behind this uh, uh, red bud, this gold red bud, uh, were planted in that video. Um, and they're all doing great. Uh, let's see, last question for this week. I think this is 23 questions. Um, Forsythia uh, pruning, um, they, their, their forsythia blooms less each year. This is not uncommon at all for forsythia to bloom less over time. They really need to be uh, pruned. Uh, once they get old, they need to, you need to start pruning about a third of the oldest branches all the way down to the ground uh, in the winter time. You don't have to do it every winter, but I would think every other winter it'd be a good idea to remove about a third of the oldest branches. And when you look down in the bottom of that plant, you'll definitely be able to tell what are the oldest branches. Because that's, you know, over, um, uh, over the years, uh, a branch will bloom, it'll bloom really heavily in its second or third year. I mean, really, really heavily by its sixth, seventh, eighth year. Uh, it just becomes woodier and woodier and it doesn't bloom as well. So go right down into the ground. The best, don't, Please don't prune your forsythia at the end of little balls. It's kind of weird um, when, I, when I see that. I like that big open look, and uh, hopefully you do as well. Just go down in the plant and cut down about a third of the oldest branches. That can be done now, could be done in the winter. Wouldn't matter. I'd probably go ahead and do it now. Um, but yes, the old branches on them bloom less uh, in, down the road. So there you go. Um, thank you guys for following along with the channel. Ask questions down below this video. I'll have another one of these uh, next week and I'm sure I'm squinting. Uh, I did not plan on the sun coming out on me while I was uh, doing this. It was supposed to be cloudy the whole time. Sorry about that. Thanks for watching.